some uh, background on the topic in general, you need to realize when it comes down to grid analytics, the last six or seven years, we've been focused very strongly on implementing DMSs, getting communications out further beyond the substation or into distribution substations, bringing back that data, getting power flows on top of that, and trying to crunch numbers uh, on how to provide more efficiency through things like full bar control or improve automated switching. We are reaching a point now where those DMS systems are getting into place. There are gaps in those systems. There are point applications that are, in many cases, are very available. And when you talk about the, the transmission network, there are also point applications around some of the newer sensors, such as synchrophasers, that are becoming available and very interesting um, for many utilities. So one thing that is starting to come about is ecosystems are starting to develop around these solutions that go beyond uh, just what is offered or the uh, basic level of functionalities that are being uh, put into place today. So with that, we have uh, Jeff McCracken, uh, the senior product line manager from ITRON within their analytics division. We have Dan Edry, the chief information and security officer for Nation E. And we have Rich Sutkus, the CEO of Ping Things. All three of these guys are doing a lot of work on smaller applications as well as some, pl some platform development in some cases to make grid analytics and to make uh, oper uh, operations just a bit easier in smaller areas. So with that, I just want to start out with the biggest question. This is something that's really prolonged larger operational systems, um, but with analytics, there might be ways around it. How good is the quality of data you guys are actually working with for the grid to kind of contextualize these systems and provide insights onto actual grid analytics? Because when you're talking consumer analytics, many cases you can work off of a smaller data sets or more traditional data sets that are cross-sector. Cross I mean, everybody has con customer analytics. If you're talking retail organizations, tons of customer analytics. But grid, there's much more specificity. So when you're looking at that from a technical perspective, with what you guys are working with, how are you finding the systems you need to plug into today? Well, I think, um, I mean, I think the climate is excellent for, for analytics and it's getting better. Um, you know, if you look at the, the AMIs, the smart meters, you're getting about uh, one record every 15 minutes. And, you know, I don't know what the stats are on the penetration of smart meters, but it's, it's, a, it's in, in the millions in the US. That's, that's a lot of data. And then if you look at the SCADA systems in the control room, you've got you know, one record every four seconds typically. And then now with the, um, on the transmission side, which is what we're looking at, um, you've got the, the, the PMUs, the synchrophasers, which are cranking out you know, 60 records every second. So when you start, when you start looking at that, now you're, now you're talking big data. And I think, um, I think it opens up new possibilities uh, you know, and new ways of looking at how to get information uh, for, for the utilities. Um, you know, there's, there, there's a lot of effort uh, currently on reporting, you know, what's currently happening, happening on, the, on the grid, but there's also now opportunities to look at, um, you know, what, what, to get some predictability in it. What does the probability of an event happening uh, in the imminent future? Um. We are actually seeing the, the data, there are data qualities, and I think a lot of the quality issues with what we're trying to do with the grid is the, is the quality of data and information around the connected model, what's typically stored in the GIS system. Um, uh, we are actually using analytics to do data cleansing uh, on, on that connected model. We, we've developed uh, an algorithm that <clears throat> looks at AMI data and, and can determine which meters are accurately connected to which distribution transformer. So we basically can go in and evaluate the, the data that the utility has and augment that. And then in addition to that is to determine what phase each of those endpoints are on. So once you know uh, how they're accurately connected and how, uh, how the phase, you know, A phase, B phase, the single phase, how that data is flowing through the system, then, then you, your connected models and your, your more advanced analytics become, you know, much more accurate. So the enabling piece is actually something that's, there's still a lot of work going on Correct. within distribution grid. Because yes. traditionally, for the most part, those assignments weren't necessarily there, right? 
the, well, so the, it depends on the utility. I mean, some utilities actually have people walking the lines to determine the connectivity and the phase. I mean, if they're valuing the, that, that data, I mean, they put effort there. So, I mean, physical labor into it. But, yeah. In our perspective, when we look about the quality of data, um, we see uh, definitely the effort that the utilities are putting in order to get as much data as they can. But when we are looking at it, we're always looking at it from the security, cybersecurity point of view. And we saw that uh, the more digitalization come into the picture, the quality of the data is going higher and higher. And therefore, we find more vulnerabilities on this aspect. So uh, we see the necessity of the data. But at the same time, we also see the necessity of how to protect it and how to make the right platform in order not to create a big damage. So uh, in this respect, um, we are helping much more on how to secure the data and how to bring it all the way up to the NOC without any infringement on the way. So preventing data quality problems in transmission and whatnot yeah. of the actual information. Okay. So Jeff, I wanted to ask you on what you're saying at least within utilities roadmaps, uh, utilities starting to implement things, kind of how are they approaching you and how is how is the deployment of these systems coming out? Because I know you guys have been working with um, MDM analytics for some time. You recently spun out some analytics into the cloud separate from the MDM. Mm -hmm. How is that discussion going? Is it very use case focused? Is it a little bit more broad? Where are we today? Well, I think there's two, two discussions happening at the utility. There's a, there is an enterprise data warehouse discussion and some would say an argument going on about which technology is best and, and, and that's being heavily influenced from uh, the big data technology discussions where some of the more conventional technologies that utilities have used today for database technologies is um, uh, somewhat different from how it's evolved through Google and Yahoo and, and uh, you know MPP systems. Uh, like Hadoop and other technologies of you know quite different than what utilities have used in the past and, but that's kind of driving the big data analytics movement in other utilities as well so that that's one conversation but then there's other conversations that are more specific to individual organizations within the utility and they're just trying to solve point problems create analytic problems here's my problem here I want to solve that and and so uh, just trying to get things done there and prove out the use case and the value of that from a pilot perspective. So uh, those are kind of two parallel themes that we're seeing. That, that's what we're seeing too. It's um, you know, it's a new area. I think I think the the onslaught of, of of data, just sheer data to utilities, is is overwhelming. And I think if you um, you know, I think they're receptive to to new ideas if you make it if you make it easy for easy for them. If you make it. Um, you know, an augmentation to their current system. Um, you know, use what they have and basically connect connect to what they use, uh, connect to what they have. I think they'll use it. And I think, to Jeff's point, what we're seeing is there's there's it's different upon utilities, but it depends upon what their hot use case is. And that's the first place that that we go. It's it's addressing that that hot point to that specific utility or or, or customer, and then you know offering other things. Uh, in a modular form, but we're, we're going at, at one use case at a time. Okay. So one thing I do want to touch on when you're, when you're kind of splitting that up, and that's one thing we actually, when we talk about analytics from a research perspective, we split it up into kind of three areas where you have actual database storage layers, you have a, a layer of data management and kind of platforms, and you have the, the actual use case layers. Um, so that bottom layer is somewhat enterprise or is becoming more and more enterprise in many utilities, right? We're looking at that, just bringing the information into a one single database or a couple or mm -hmm. cutting down on the number of databases. One thing I have a question for you, Dan, is when we're talking about building those platforms, bringing in data from many sources, there's different requirements for cybersecurity among those sources that may or may not uh, provide some uh, confusion or potential problems. Kind of how should a utility be thinking about cybersecurity within that uh, within that mindset of bringing more and more data from across the enterprise with various uh, levels of, of security on it? The first time we actually uh, faced this kind of problems was when we started to work at Europe with utilities. And then we discovered that 
um, a lot of multi-vendors are going into this area, what we call smart grid. And every meter manufacturer has his own platform of communication, his own database, and you have a lot of different controlling system, and you have a lot of different third-party applications that are coming in, and the utilities are trying to do the best to prevent this multi-vendor approach. And at the end of the day, they would like to aggregate everything into one gateway that they will have the capability to reach the information and on top of it create cybersecurity platform. The rules uh, and the laws in cybersecurity are very clear. The more sources you have to aggregate and the more data you need to deal with, the more data analytics tools and data validation you will bring into the system, this is where the problems start from the threats. And we saw it exactly what happened uh, with the energetic bear. It was exactly the same platform. There is a lot of data sources that are coming into the utility from different angles that you don't even think about it, from the private email of the employee up to the SCADA system that is exposed and, and the meter communication that are completely exposed. So the needs of the utility today is they would like to create a system that they will talk only to one gateway and behind this gateway, they don't care about the multi-vendor approach. But one step before it reaching to the high voltage SCADA monitoring system, they would like to have one gateway. So what uh, a part of the solution that uh, uh, utilities are looking for right now is actually the end-to-end -end solution because currently everybody is concentrated only on the communication up to the meter level. But everybody uh, understand that Internet of Things is coming into the smart grid, meaning that at the end of the day, the energy storage and the PV and the generator and the electric vehicle and the home automation, everything is going to talk to the same system. And the utility would like to have the approach with a long arm to reach you in the house and to get this data in order to create what we really call a smart grid. And this is where the gateway is a very important issue to put it as a barrier before the customer and basically to protect the knock level. So the centralized system is a must in every single respect of cybersecurity of one single platform. Okay. So you mentioned IoT, and I, I want to extend that because I'm not a huge fan of the IoT uh, terminology because it means a lot of things to a lot of people. Um, but when we talk about decentralized decision making, uh, decentralized intelligence, uh, putting computing power out on the grid to actually do some calculations and potentially respond, that's one thing that's becoming increasingly interesting to many utilities and becoming increasingly interesting among a lot of R&D projects within the vendor community with some of the leading utilities. How does that kind of flip our traditional discussion about grid analytics? How does that, how's that actually affecting the IT architectures within the utility? I don't know if Jeff, you want to start off? Sure. I mean, Bud hit on this yesterday when we were in the session about where, and, and we, everyone voted on where analytics is going to be. And, is it going to be in the back office or going to be at the edge? And the majority of people voted, <clears throat> voted for the edge. We, we actually are looking at it um, at, at different layers. It makes sense to do the analytics um, based on a few factors. So their analytics can be done at the edge, at the end point. Analytics can be done uh, in, in, in the middle, in the network, in a router. Example, field router. Analytics can be done in the back office. And the criteria that you know, you need to look at is what, so what is the use case and how do you, what's best to solve the use case that you're particularly working for? And the criteria we're looking at is the, the breadth of knowledge that you need to solve that particular problem, um, the latency of the data that's required to make the decision about the problem, mm -hmm. and then the, just the, the data granularity. I mean, uh, at the endpoint, you can have one second granularity uh, in the meter itself, in the back office, you can get, you know, obviously hourly interval data, maybe down to five minute interval data. So the, the granularity and the latency makes a big difference. So, and depending on the problem you're trying to solve, it just makes sense to move it to the right location. If it's a real time problem, it's localized, then it should be done at the edge. I don't know if Rich, you want to add? Yeah, so, w so we're looking on the other side, we're, we're looking on the transmission side. So the answer for me on that question yesterday was, the information is going to stay with the utility because we're on the transmission side, um, and um, you know I think the there, there's benefits to that um, because what we're addressing is the is the the ROI for the utility, and if you look at a utility who's got a billion in revenue, they've got three billion in assets, and so that's 
that's where we're looking at, I think, in terms of Internet of Things and, 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 and how we're utilizing that. It's to address that, that, that opportunity. Okay. Okay. Um, just to get a little bit more information, I know we, we talked a little bit earlier that you guys are doing some work with PMUs and potentially some mm -hmm. going beyond the wide area management, a wide area of measurement where you're just providing visualization back in the back office to actually kind of getting intermedial schemes and actionable intelligence mm -hmm. locally. What's, how's that kind of fitting into that discussion around decentralized intelligence for you guys? Is it, what kind of architectures is that coming up with? How is it being perceived within, you know, I'd imagine it's connecting to an EMS, for instance. Yeah, so we're looking at, <clears throat> Again, we're, we're, we're making it as, as innocuous and friendly as possible. So we'll, we'll, we've got a loosely coupled platform, which means we'll connect with anything. We'll connect, we'll connect to their historian, whatever they're using, OSI soft, whatever UI they're using. And basically, we're focusing on, on sort of the engine, which is you know, predict, predictive analytics. And, and so how we're seeing the, the benefit is it's not just reporting real time, but it's, it's giving you know, intelligence as to you know a specific event uh, occurring, and um, so it could be, you know, could be in some type of an impact to the to the grid uh, to avoid a costly alternative. Alternative, um, it could be an asset that is uh, that's failing, and the, and the primary assets a, is is the tra as a transformer, for mm -hmm. example. Um, you can get you know signals from the from the data. You can get patterns and, and anomalies that will give you pretty high probability that something is going to happen in, in the you know, X future, Y future from now. Um, so that, that's, that's what we're seeing. Um, so I got time for probably two more questions before we hit audience. So I'm going to uh, cut this down a little bit. But I just wanted to ask uh, quickly, though, when it comes down to Internet of Things, I know, uh, Dan, we talked for a while yesterday about this. Uh, it's got to be an exciting thing for a cybersecurity firm, but an extremely scary thing as well, um, especially when you're getting into customer level devices potentially being connected in with the utility. And I, how, is, how are you guys approaching that? How are customers of yours approaching thoughts around controlling customer devices or putting, adjusting through traditional ways of having you know, a single vertical system to control voltage reactive power, a single vertical system to control the switches on the grid. So how is that all fitting together for you guys and kind of what's the conversations that you're having right now? Currently, um, as we all know, when uh, you connect PV in your house, it's nothing else but a solar panel and uh, inverter converter and some kind of controller. But everybody immediately uh, put in their hands that we're talking about only energy, physical lines of energy. But, and this is where uh, the Internet of Things come into the picture. This is where the mistakes are starting to, to happen because this controller of the inverter converter is basically data. It's a protocol of communication. And at the end of the day, it will need to talk to some kind of a hub or a concentrator that will concentrate the metering infrastructure. And from this point all the way up to the NOC, on a TCP IP structure. So basically now this PV and this controller is no longer a standalone unit which deliver energy, but it's also a data infrastructure that connect to a data infrastructure of the utility. And from this point, the sky is the limit. So the concerns of the utility today is actually, as I mentioned, is to create this firewall of energy before the knock level, meaning whatever happened in the house the customer needs to be protected in his infrastructure on the data level and also the utility. Because, and, and we talked about uh, yesterday a few examples. If I can reach the, the, the controller or the PV and I can start to switch on and off things, this is the easiest part. But if I will start to combine data and to change currency and voltage, I can create different damages. And this is where um, the, uh, I would say the Homeland Security coming into the picture together with utility. And these are the people we are working with in order to create the right platform because utility is critical infrastructure. And we need to create the right platform that this Internet of Things will also be in the most secure level one to protect first the utility and then afterwards the consumer. Um, in regards to data privacy and, and the issue of privacy, this right now is not under concern of yeah. anyone. 
Well, I mean, first and foremost would be the infrastructure itself being tapped. Uh, yeah. AMI meters would be a concern for sure, but the biggest ones would be substation infrastructure, which are usually SCADA siloed off, but distribution grid on the feeders, a lot of those are on common communication systems with many other things. You know, I would imagine that would be the first and foremost thing that comes up, correct? Yeah, Ben, I mean, uh, before us there was a guy from uh, Nest who spoke here. And uh, Nest is a beautiful product, and now they're creating a platform where you can uh, connect your car and you connect a lot of different applications so everybody understand uh, what happens if you get this data and the correlation between if you're in the house to set up your temperature or your, your location of the car is far away from the house and the security system is also implemented, do the mathematics and understand what can happen. Yeah. All right, so I'm gonna finish up just with right now, today, use cases that are available that are, you've either implemented or are implementing right now. Where are you guys seeing the most value in grid an analytics? And this is gonna be a little bit biased, obviously, for what you guys are up to, but I just wanted to start with Jeff. And um, I think there's a huge value in, in leveraging the smart meter stream of data, and that, that goes well beyond just the AMI interval kilowatt hour data. I mean, uh, when you look at that device as a voltage sensor that's sitting on every single customer and you have secondary voltage, you know, signatures and profiles across your whole distribution. I mean, it, it, before we had only information in the substation. It really, it was, bl you know, really blind of what was happening beyond the substation. And now they can, you know, we can measure voltage at every single endpoint. And that's just driving a ton of use cases, including volt bar optimization, um, CVR. That's, there's a real, real potential there. Yeah, and for a lot of these, for most utilities, I'd say, with AMI, they've just started getting into that voltage data the last Correct. six months to a year. And there are some, right. obviously, leaders, but right. yeah, that's very interesting. I don't know if Dan or Rich. Uh, we're looking at a couple things right now. Um, one is um, uh, GMD, geomagnetic disruption um, from solar flares and how that impacts the grid, because it, it, it could be devastating. Uh, and and um, that's uh, at the behest of um, the DOE and NASPI, which is why we took on this use case. Um, but it has ramifications for every utility because FERC is issuing an order uh, 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 for this, uh, for this um, uh, incident. And then the second one is um, uh, uh, condition maintenance uh, for utility, uh, which is um, predictive analytics for, and we're focusing on, on transformer, transformer health. So back to the basics, focus on Yep. where the, the cost drivers yep. are. I mean, there's, there's, I mean, there's, a, there's, you know, there's a bunch of other areas. Um, there's a distributed generation impacts to the grid is another one. And uh, we were talking about that today and yesterday. Security is another one, which is IDAN's working on. But that's, we, we, can, we can look at it from a different way for what we're doing. Um, there's just, a, you know, there's probably a dozen good ones. Yeah, and that, that's the hard part is geographically, it's very specific to utilities themselves. But mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, with that, we got about 10 minutes for uh, audience driven Q&A. I don't know if anybody. Yeah, one on the left here. Uh, uh, thank you, guys. Um, <clears throat> I'd spent a lot of time thinking about bringing this new energy future on the distribution grid side of things, and so I have a little bit harder time grasping it on the transmission side. And uh, Rich, I, I trust you got a great business model because we went to business school together. Um, <laughs> But uh, the, um, my question for you is, uh, I, I, I get you know, kind of the use case you just described, and I, but I'm wondering, um, is this a better mousetrap for the utilities to either keep a transmission grid up, you know, to, to basically ride through kind of voltage and frequency disruptions, or is it more to um, improve the, the recovery? So if the transmission grid goes down, how fast they can bring it back up. I'm just, I'm just trying to kind of grasp what your solution is, is solving for the, the utility, and, and you mentioned ROI, so there's an improvement there in terms of operational effectiveness and, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, financial efficiency. So I mean I think um, I think both of those go hand in hand. I mean we're we're focused on you know the predictive alert component of it, um, but that being said, once something happens, you get smarter about it. So then that will also aid in forensics. 
and you go backwards and figure out what, um, you know, what happened. Um, so I think, it's, I think it's both of those buckets, but we, we are primarily looking at you know, giving a, a warning. So for example, with GMD, uh, if a utility even had four minutes warning that there's a GIC, which is a geomagnetic induced current on the, on the line, uh, that's enough for them to take action. So it's either, you know, down the road, it, it could be automated, but right now there probably have to be some type of a human interaction, but you can, you know, reroute, uh, uh, you know, reroute uh, or take a transformer offline. That type of scenario is, is what we're looking to do now. That being said, what we're, our, our platform and our, our engine is, is smart, and it gets smarter with more data. So, um, you know, you can go backwards and refine algorithms, refine, you know, other data sources, bring in other data sources, wait, wait it a little bit more. Um, there's a heavy reliance right now when you, when you um, uh, look at grid modeling with utilities. It's primarily based on system models and simulations, and we, we, we have none of that. We look at the empirical data, and we, we can do that now because we've got so much data. Um, one, you know, just the data that we're looking at, one utility will have, you know, billions, billions of records a month. And, um, you know, if you've got enough data and you've got, you know, enough classifiers, you can pretty much solve anything. Um, or give a, high, give a high probability of something, something occurring. Could I maybe ask a corollary question? Um, a couple of years ago, there was the, the, the rogue voltage uh, 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 level that came out of the nuclear power plant in Arizona, that effect cascaded, brought down transmission, turned off generation, and basically turned the lights out in, in San Diego for almost 24 hours. With that type of uh, rogue voltage signal on transmission, is that something that your solution could, could eventually predict or, or uh, yeah, solve? Yeah, maybe. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know what the, the details on that, but, you know, it's, it's it, it, you know when you talk about a cascading event, something had to trigger that, and so we try to get in the beginning to look at, um, you know, if there is a triggering event, uh, and that is a possibility, uh, that would be a use case, and we would get a handle on that on that specific event, and that's a specific signature we would look at, just like an ailing transformer, like a you know starts to when it starts to degrade, it'll spark like the the bushings or an insulator will spark. We can detect that spark. If it sparks repeatedly and it's in a certain time frame, that means something. Thank you. Yeah. And one thing I do want to mention on your piece when you're talking about getting eventually towards automation but having human intervention for now, and this is repeated over and over, but utilities are conservative organizations because they have billions of dollars of equipment on the line. There are cases today even where there's automated switching that can work on its own, and you know, utilities will have it generate a switch order and put it on a, so I've, one of the cleverest ones I've run into is have it execute in five minutes. So you have four minutes to evaluate it. You avoid the safety and safety penalties. But at least that engineer is more comfortable because he can say, oh yes, it works. And after a year or two of that, they end up saying the system works, it's fine, and then they can move into the automated. So that's right, that's right. Especially when you're talking transmission grid, that's a much longer term piece. They want to make sure everything's working perfectly before they set it off on its own. Yep, that's right. So, I don't know if we have any other questions. I think everybody had late nights last night, it looks like. <laughs> um, so one thing I was curious about, uh, and we didn't get, we wasn't sure we were gonna get a chance for this, but the questions I run into with analytics that are always, they're hard to answer because you have to get to the point where you're deployed to answer them, but the business processes and the provisionings of that, provisioning access to things and how people are actually interacting with these systems. I want to start it out from the cybersecurity angle. Um, then I was going to trickle in if we have time. We might run out of time, but when it comes down to provisioning, how, how are utilities doing it now? How, how should they be doing it? What's, what's kind of the process there when you're talking about having a bunch of data in one historian, and you have potentially tens or hundreds or thousands of users of that data? Well, actually, right now, um, it's only the SCADA. That's uh, more or less what their uh, provisioning is dealing with, and what kind of access control, and who is allowed to, 
and what type of information you have. But uh, this is right now not the biggest problem. What they need to adapt themselves and to change the infrastructure is once they're starting to get a lot of different databases into the SCADA. And this is where uh, you break, um, let's just say, a conservative approach of only SCADA system with a monitoring infrastructure with one database. And now all of a sudden you expanded it to a lot of different sources. And um, one of the things that we are working right now in order to uh, prepare the utilities and the integration of other third party application into the SCADA is really, as you said, to create this kind of um, layers of security of uh, what you can do, who is allowed to get, what is open into the world, what is the right um, approach to do the cybersecurity platform on the assets level or on the SCADA, because we always, always take in consideration that there's not going to be a smart grid only based on the smart meter. This is the, the, right now the assumption. We're gonna talk about implementing of PVs inside, of energy storage, of electric vehicle, of home automation platform, of Nest, that's going to be there. And, and once we're gonna enter this area, the, the system needs to be ready, otherwise you have a complete chaos from the cybersecurity point of view. And, and um, one of the questions and the things that we are talking about today, if you want to shut down the grid, you don't need even to do a cyber attack. I mean, we heard it a couple of, uh, I don't know if it was a, a months or a year ago, that uh, there was a sharpshooter that shoot a transformer here in California and took down a couple of millions of people from electricity. And out of this come the article where I was uh, participated in this uh, um, a committee that was here in, in Washington, D.C., that said basically you need only 17 transformers to shoot and you shut down the United States grid to one and a half years. And I'm not saying it because I said it. You can also read it in New York Times. So the vulnerability is there. But when we, everybody's talking about data analytics and to create the data and to what are we doing with the data and how important it is to secure it. But at the end of the day, we always need to take in consideration that smart grid is like internet. And if we're not gonna be ready for this kind of implementation and a lot of sources, there's going to start a problem. And uh, cybersecurity is definitely inside of it. Got so, a question? Oh, we got a question. Okay. Thanks. Sorry, I'm gonna take advantage of having an ITRON expert up there because the Clean Coalition spends you know, most of its time looking at, at the distribution grid and distributed energy resources. And you know, obviously local renewables, energy storage, demand response, advanced inverter functionality, all of that's, you know, those are the core solutions. But to tie all that together, you need the monitoring communications and control, which I think is what ITRON and its smart meters at least partially provide. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what kind of functionality your smart meters actually have that are deployed today in terms of, you, you obviously can measure voltage, you can probably measure frequency, um, but you, so you can send that information back to the utility for some kind of central command, um, but do you actually have the ability to control anything with your, with your smart meters as well to react to voltage or frequency deviations? <clears throat> Um, well, the, the smart meter is a, a two-way communication, and the, the main control that you have in the smart meter is there is a switch in, in every meter. So um, opening that switch is, a, is the main thing you can do, and, and there's algorithms in the meter that allows the meter to monitor the, the load, uh, and, and you can implement DR programs based on a set load. If a, if a customer exceeded a certain load, you could, you could throw the switch if you were in some kind of DR response program. But, but really, uh, the functionality in today's deployed smart meters is about the, the two-way interaction, uh, the alerts, the alarms, outage alerts, tamper alerts, voltage high and low uh, alerts, as well as the KVAR, KWH, uh, I mean demand, voltage, all of that, uh, you know, that data being available. Um, to the utility, streaming to the utility as well as, uh, you know, through interaction, uh, you know, is, is there power at this meter now? Is there the line side voltage? Those types of questions you can, you can interact with the meter. I think one of the important things that might be worth mentioning also is what is actually being pulled back now? What's actually being utilized now? Because many of those functionalities, mm -hmm. out of that 15, it's, I mean, most utilities imagine it's five or six, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, 
<laughs> I'll, I'll let you go on that. You're more so, familiar. Yeah, so the obviously kilowatt hour data is the, is the primary, and, and that's typically uh, from what we've seen is hourly for residential, 15 to five minute data for CNI customers that's coming back every day for all customers. But we are seeing utilities start starting to turn on the voltage profiles uh, for, for either a select set of meters, bellwether meters distributed throughout the feeder, or for all the meters uh, and, and you know hourly 15 minute, five minute voltage data. But what we're seeing with the problems with DG uh, coming online, the PV in particular, the voltage problems that that's crea creating are, are really localized and specific and to, to troubleshoot those problems the utilities are, is really looking for very granular voltage data to figure out what's happening in those situations and uh, manage that. So. so doing a bit more on the actually calling uh, and asking for additional information beyond yeah. that 15 minute. For example, you, you get a high voltage alarm or low voltage alarm so you, you know there's a condition and then, and then uh, go back to the meter and say, okay, give me all the voltage data from all the meters associated with this distribution transformer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so with that, we're a couple minutes over. I believe we're going, are we going straight in or we got a break? Thank you. Uh, about a 15 minute break. Um, so see you all back in here around 1030.